Well, welcome. We're glad that you're here with us. Let's praise God together. It's good to be reminded that God has been faithful through everything that you've ever been through. He's been faithful through all the storms. He is, uh, he is a God of miracles, and he's done great things. And so we celebrate that today. We celebrate the goodness of God in the midst of wherever you are. And you are not alone. Let's praise him together.
I have a hope. I have a hope. I have a future. I have a destiny that is yet awaiting me. My life's not over. A new beginning just begun. I have a hope. I have this hope. God has a plan, it's not to harm me, but it's to prosper me, and to hear me when I call, He intercedes for me, working all things for my good, though trials may come, I have this hope, I will yet praise Him, my great Redeemer, I will yet stand. God is for me, He's not against me, so tell me who then, tell me who that child I feel He has prepared for me, great works He'll help me to complete, I have a hope, I have this hope, goodness and mercy, they're gonna follow me, and I'll forever dwell. In the house of my great king, no eye has ever seen All is preparing there for me Though trials may come, I have this hope I will yet praise him, my great redeemer I will yet stand up and give him glory with my life It takes my darkness and it turns it God of heaven loves me. There's still hope for me today, cause the God of heaven loves me. There's still hope for me today, cause the God of stand up and give him glory with my life he takes my darkness and he turns it into light i will yet praise him my lord my god i will yet i will yet praise him my great redeemer i will yet stand up and give him glory with my life he takes my darkness turns it into light. I will yet praise Him, my Lord, my God. There's still hope for me, and there's still hope for me today, because the God of heaven loves me. There's still hope for me today, cause the God of heaven loves me. Wow, what an awesome truth. The God of heaven loves me. The God of heaven loves you. Our faith candle is lit this morning because there are 20 families, 20 individuals, who represent families in Laos, who made first-time commitments to Jesus in the last month. Uh, there is an organization called Ethos Asia that we have been sending funds to. They have been 
putting together food packages and sending those out to families in Sri Lanka and Pakistan and in Laos and had an opportunity to actually share the gospel. And 20 people became first-time believers in Jesus. They found that hope that is in the love of Jesus. And so we continue to pray and rejoice with them. Welcome, if you are worshiping with us this morning. Um, we are so glad that you are here. Do me a favor, give a shout out to everybody. Wave. Hi, glad you're with us. Glad to see you. I think I actually heard some of you saying hi just now. That is cool. Um, welcome, whether or not you're part of the Glenkirk family or joining in from around the country. Um, we're glad that you are have tuned in. Would you do me a favor? Would you go online at some point to www.glenkirkchurch forward slash news and fill out our connection card. Um, let us know of a way that we can be praying for you. You also at that site might look at our weekly Devo, our weekly bulletin. If you go to our elementary area, you will discover that we have made some changes with Vacation Bible School this year. Um, we are, have sent some information out to you. Um, you probably should have gotten that on, on Friday of this week. Um, we're kind of changing the format due to this current pandemic, but we are excited about some of the surprises that we have planned in the midst of all that, but you wanna, might want to check that out. At our elementary and our early childhood site, there are also some online resources that you might use in order to help your kids understand a little bit about what Jesus wants to do in their life and about Jesus' love for them. Um, next week, we're going to begin a whole brand new sermon series called The Way of Jesus. And we're going to be taking a look at John chapters 14, 15, and 16. It's kind of Jesus' farewell message to his disciples. And it has some of the most profound truths about what it means to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus. And so we would encourage you to tune in next week. Um, we also would encourage you, if you're not in a small group, um, to maybe join a small group for that sermon series to see how that God, how we can apply that to our individual lives. At this time, uh, we're going to go to a word of prayer. And as we pray, um, I'm going to pray a couple phrases, and then I'm going to ask that you would respond out loud, Lord, hear our prayer. And kids, as we go through this prayer, I'm going to continue to use my hand. Um, see if you can follow along with where we're at. So let's begin. Lord, thanks for our family and our friends. Lord, help us be there for them as they're available to us. Help us love our brothers and our sisters well. Give us and them patience and energy and all the things that we need during this time, even though we're stuck at home and, and we're pulled in so many different directions. Lord, hear our prayers. And Lord, help us discern what you want us to do and what you want us to be. Help us spur each other on to being fully devoted disciples of you. And Lord, we pray for single parents and for those who work while trying to care for families. Lord, build strong marriages. Lord, hear our prayers. And Lord, thanks for those who serve us on the front lines, for the doctors and the nurses and the postal employees, and those who work in the supermarkets and our police and, and firemen and women. Keep them safe. Give them the needed energy. Help them know what to do, when and how, and give their families good health and peace. Lord, hear our prayers. And Lord, we thank you for the media, for those who bring us the news and keep us informed. Lord, give them discernment and wisdom and give us wisdom and discernment as we listen and process all the information that is out there. Keep us from anxiety and enable us to love and respond the way you loved and responded. Lord, hear our prayers. And Lord, we pray for missionaries around the world. Give them words of hope. Equip them to love and serve those around them. Give them needed resources. And may they be safe. And may much kingdom fruit come from their ministry. And Lord, give us wisdom at Glenkirk and other churches as to how to help and grow others up in you during this time. 
Lord, hear our prayers. And Lord, give our leaders wisdom and discernment. Help them communicate well with one voice. May they look to you and may you give them direction. Lord, hear our prayers. And for those who feel isolated and anxious and helpless, Lord, provide their every necessity. Give them support. And for those who are in nursing home where that virus can spread like a wildfire, bring your presence, bring your love, be with families who can't be together, bring healing. Lord, hear our prayers. And for the homeless and those in refugee camps, and those who live in the poorer areas of the world where they're unable to social distance, where they don't have food, where they don't have resources like medical help, Lord, protect and provide for them. Lord, hear our prayers. And Lord, may we speak your words this week and think your thoughts. May we be your hands and feet. Thank you that you desire to use us in your great work of building your kingdom, that even in our weaknesses, you are able to fulfill your mighty purposes through us. Empower us with your spirit. May we be channels of your love and compassion. Lord, hear our prayers. And Lord, prepare our hearts that we might walk into this new world. May we see what you are doing. Forgive us for getting trapped in our own ideas of how things should be. May we be open to you. Lord, hear our prayers. And let us pray together the prayer that you taught us to say together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Every week we take an offering here at Glenkirk. It's our opportunity to express our thanks to God for what he has given to us. And it's always a step of trust to say, God, I know that you're going to continue to resource me, to give me the things that I need on a daily basis. And so we would encourage you at some point to go on to the Glenkirk site at www glenkirkchurch.org forward slash give and give either to our journal fund and then over and above that to our deacon fund to help folks in our local community or a mission fund to help people in Laos or India or around the world. God bless you. My hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest rain, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone.
Mercy never fails me, and all my days have been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. Though my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire In darkest nights You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness of God all my life And all my life You have been faithful And all my life You have been so, so running after me with my life laid down I surrender now I give you everything your goodness is running after it's running after me let's sing that again your goodness your goodness is running after it's running after me your goodness is running after it's running
Well, good morning, Glenkirk friends and family. So glad to be with you to worship through this broadcast this morning. George was a Nazi, at least as much of a Nazi as a 17-year-old high school student could be. You see, George lived in Germany during the Second World War in the early 1940s. He was active in Hitler Youth and an avid reader of the atheist philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, which I'm sure made him very popular at the high school dances. In 1944, George was drafted and sent to the front lines of the war. There, George was eventually captured by British soldiers and incarcerated as a POW, first in Belgium, then later in Scotland, and then later in England. And while George was incarcerated as a prisoner of war, he was shown pictures of Auschwitz, and he was told stories about what was happening throughout Europe at concentration camps. And George sunk into a deep depression as he was filled with remorse and shame over what his government had been doing and over what he had been fighting for. George slipped into a very dark place, telling people around him that he wished he had just died in battle rather than survived. And that continued until a chaplain gave George a Bible and he started reading it. Then George met a group of Christians at the prisoner of war camp that introduced him to a relationship with Jesus. As George would later say, he didn't find Christ, Christ found him. And after World War II was over, George was released from the prisoner of war camp and returned to his homeland, Germany, and found that his homeland was in ruins and disarray. And so at 22 years old, George believed that God was calling him to reintroduce the Christian faith to the people of his nation. George went to college and grad school and eventually became a theologian and wrote many books on theology and his, his approach to Christian theology was called a theology of hope. George, or the, the German version of his name, Jürgen, Jürgen was able to find his way out of that dark place of despair through hope. And with that hope, he was able to invite others to do the same. In fact, Jürgen Moltmann would become one of the most influential Reformed theologians of the entire 20th century. This morning, we are in the final week of our five-week series, Living in Exile. And in this series, we've been looking at Israel's exile to Babylon as a, a kind of model for how we can live faithfully as God's people during a time of public crisis. And we focused our attention on the Hebrew prophet Jeremiah and his letter that he wrote to the exiles in Babylon found in Jeremiah chapter 29. And in that 29th chapter of Jeremiah, we've seen that the first response to a major social crisis among God's people is lament. That was Jeremiah's response as Pastor Betsy showed us from the book of Lamentations in our first week, 
We lament when we take our grief and our losses during a time of crisis and we take them to God in prayer. And we've all experienced losses during this public health crisis. We lament over the loss of life. I I know of a church in New York that's lost 5% of its members to this virus. We lament the stress on our economy, the the families and small businesses that are struggling to pay their bills, the, the struggles of life in isolation, of our temporary inability to meet together for worship. Lament means bringing those losses to God in prayer and reminding God of His promises and asking God to intervene and to work. Then we talked about adjusting. Adjusting to our new circumstances. And in week two, we looked at a teenage exile named Daniel and how he adjusted. That he adjusted by refusing to let his crisis, the exile, define him. By living with integrity, by using his gifts, and by finding new ways to worship God since he was unable to worship in the temple the way he had grown up. In week three, we talked about seeking the common good. Jeremiah's letter urges exiles to seek the peace and prosperity of the whole community, of the whole city, to not just seek our own peace. God calls His people to seek the common good, especially during times of public crisis. And that week we looked at how two exiles, Mordecai and Esther, did this in their situation by living wisely and by protecting the lives of those around them and by stewarding the opportunities God gave them and by living out their faith with courage. Finally, last week we talked about discerning the truth. During times of social crisis, we are bombarded with conflicting claims about what's really happening, about why it's happening, and about what should be done about what's happening. And we see a rise in conspiracy theories and and novel and strange theological claims. And living well in exile means learning to discern those things well. And we saw that discernment requires open hearts and a humble posture. It requires a knowledge of biblical doctrine in a community of godly leaders. Today, as we reach the final week of this series, I want to talk about hope. You know, the New Testament book of Hebrews pictures hope as being like an anchor. An anchor for our souls, an anchor that tethers us to the promises of God, creating within us an assurance that the future will be better than our present and better than our past. Hope anchors us in the reality that no matter how hard our circumstances are in the moment, that we can make choices that move us into that better future that God has for us. And so as we explore hope during a time of social crisis, this morning we're going to look first at verses 10 and 11 of Jeremiah's letter to the exiles in Jeremiah 29. And then we're going to look at how one exile modeled hope during his time of crisis. So let's begin by looking at verses 10 and 11 of Jeremiah's letter. Jeremiah 29, beginning in verse 10. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Verse 11 is probably the most famous verse from Jeremiah. Maybe you've seen it on license plate frames or on internet memes on social media. The the exile had disrupted the people's plans for their lives. When the Babylonian armies surrounded the city and invaded, families were torn apart, weddings were postponed, businesses were closed, farms were lost, schools were shuttered, the economy tanked, and God's people lived in fear and in despair. And of course, many of our plans have been disrupted by this public health crisis. 
everything from weddings to, to high school and college graduations, from, from travel plans to sporting events, from, from keeping a business going and even expanding it to going to school. And here God tells us that although our plans may have been disrupted, God still has good plans for your future and for mine. God's plans for us are for our blessing. The word prosper in verse 11 is the Hebrew word shalom, which means peace, wholeness, restoration, and flourishing. The Hebrew word for plans in verse 11 is a fascinating word. The, the Hebrew word for plans comes from a Hebrew word, word that means to weave different things together. God's plans for us weaves everything that happens together. This word for plans is the Old Testament equivalent of Romans 8.28 in the New Testament, which says that God makes all things work together for the good of those who love God and who are called according to God's purposes. God weaves it all together, even the hard things, for good plans during this stay-at-home order, my, my 20-year-old stepson has been teaching himself how to bake. In fact, on Mother's Day, he, he made a, an apple cheesecake for, for Cindy from scratch. And when you're baking, some of the ingredients that you use when you bake, they taste really good just all on their own. But some of the ingredients don't. Ingredients like powdered sugar and frosting and caramel, those all taste great on their own. But, but other ingredients that we use like flour and baking soda and vanilla extract, those taste pretty gross all on their own. But when all of those ingredients are combined in just the right proportion and put at just the right temperature for just the right period of time, all of those ingredients weave together to create something good. God is able to take all of our experiences, the ones that feel good, and even the bitter ones, and weave them together to achieve His good plans, His plans to give you a hope and a future. This last week, my oldest son's fiance sent me some articles and links about the science of hope because she knew I was talking about hope this Sunday. For the last several years, scientists have been studying the effect of hope on people. She recommended I look at the book Hope Rising by attorney Casey Gwynn and social scientist Chan Hellman, where they say in that book that hope can literally change the direction of a person's life. And they talk about all the studies done on the power of hope to help trauma survivors and cardiac patients, paralyzed athletes and cancer survivors and natural disaster victims and victims of domestic abuse. And in fact, more than 2,000 academic studies have been done on the power of hope to help people through adversity. So for the rest of my time, I want to look at how one exile was able to lean into hope, the anchor of hope. And the person I want to talk about is an exile named Nehemiah. Nehemiah was most likely born in Babylon during the exile. And after the Babylonian Empire collapsed, Nehemiah found himself living in Persia, serving in the king's court in the Persian Empire. Nehemiah was the cup-bearer for King Artaxerxes. As cup-bearer, it was Nehemiah's job to bring the food and wine to the king to eat, Nehemiah tasting it first to make sure that it wasn't poisoned. Being a cup-bearer was a position of deep trust, though as often as people poisoned each other back then, it didn't exactly have much job security to it. After the 70 years of exile were over, the Persian Empire began to allow God's people to begin returning to Jerusalem, to their homeland. But Nehemiah remained in Persia. After a major social crisis, the return after the crisis is rarely a return to the way things were before. 
So even though people were returning to Jerusalem to their land, Israel was still under foreign control. Their city was still in ruins. Their temple still destroyed. Their economy still in crisis. The exile may have been over, but the the path to recovery was going to be difficult and challenging. And Nehemiah gets word of those challenges. In chapter 1 of the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah hears about these struggles and he prays. And then in chapter 2, he asks the king's permission to return to Jerusalem. People often credit Nehemiah's primary achievement as rebuilding the walls around Jerusalem. But Nehemiah's most profound achievement was actually helping people hope again. Helping the people of God see that the future could be better than their present and motivating them to lean into that hope. So let's consider the power of hope from the book of Nehemiah. We're going to look at four things from Nehemiah's life. First, hope leads us to see possibilities. Hope leads us to see the possibilities. After arriving in Jerusalem in chapter 2, Nehemiah inspected the walls around the city. He didn't tell anybody about his desire to rebuild the walls. He just assessed the damage. And the damage was considerable. The city was a mess. But then look what he says in chapter 2, verses 16 and 17 and 18. Then I said to the people, You see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me, and what the king had said to me. Nehemiah helped the people look up. Look up from the burned gates and the the piles of rubble that had once been walls to look up and to see what could be. Nehemiah generated hope that a better future was possible. And that's what hope does. It helps us look up from the challenges of our present and to see the possibilities As we think about reopening from this public health crisis in the weeks and the months ahead, I wonder what new possibilities our hope will lead us to see. And I know things are still bleak. I know people are still getting sick and dying, that our economy is struggling, our unemployment rate is high. I know that people are are more divided than ever in our country. But even in the midst of those bitter ingredients... God still has good plans, and hope will lead us to see those good plans, to find opportunities and possibilities for the future. Our future may not look exactly like our past looked, but our future can still be good, filled with hope, filled with the prosperity of God's shalom, of God's peace. Secondly, hope also leads us to persevere through adversity. It leads us to persevere through adversity. See, not everybody was happy about God's people rebuilding the walls. Some of the neighboring peoples opposed Nehemiah's efforts. And rather than reading to you about it from Nehemiah chapter 4, I'd actually like to show you a video about this opposition. And if you have kids watching with you or kids in the house, this would be a great time to corral them into the room to tune into the message. So let's check out this video about rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Nehemiah went to Jerusalem to help the people rebuild the city walls. The people started working together to fix the walls and the burned down gates. The walls and gates had special names. Some of the people worked on the fish gate. The fish gate was the entrance to the fish market. Some people worked on the sheep gate. This gate led to the place men gathered to sell sheep. Others worked on the valley gate the old gate, and the horse gate. The workers put in doors, bolts, and bars. They cut stones and lifted them into place on the wall, and they filled in gaps and holes. All around the city, 
people worked side by side. Soon, the wall was half as tall as it had once been. Not everyone was happy that Jerusalem's walls were being rebuilt. Some men who lived nearby were angry. Sanballat and Tobiah mocked the people. Sanballat said, what do these people think they are doing? These walls are just piles of trash and dirt. They can't be rebuilt. Nehemiah prayed. God's people kept working on the walls, but their enemies made a plan to attack them and stop their work. God's people prayed and assigned men to guard the walls all day and all night, but they were discouraged. Our enemies are everywhere, they said. Nehemiah reminded the people that God was with them. Do not be afraid. God is great and powerful, Nehemiah said. Be ready. If our enemies attack us, God will fight for us. Sanballat and Tobiah could threaten God's people, but they could not make God's people stop building. Sanballat and Tobiah were not in charge of rebuilding the wall. God was. So God's people went back to work. Some stood guard with weapons and others worked on the wall. Some men worked with one hand and held a weapon in the other. They were always ready to fight, just in case. Nehemiah was a wise and good leader of God's people while they worked. He helped them solve any problems they had, and he did not give in to their enemies. The people kept working very hard. In just 52 days, the wall was complete. The gates were repaired and the wall was restored. When all of Jerusalem's enemies heard that the wall had been rebuilt, they were afraid because they knew God was with his people. Nehemiah led the people to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem to protect them from their enemies. Jesus came to protect us from our enemies. He died on the cross and rose from the dead to rescue people from sin and death. Hope leads us to persevere through adversity. You see, adversity often feels like it's going to crush us, whether it's internal adversity, like like feeling like we're too weak to keep going, or that we're not capable enough, or that we're we're not worth enough to keep going, or or it's external pressures like roadblocks and obstacles and naysayers in our lives that, that try to tear us down. You know, when I was in college, my, my major, I was a biblical and theological studies major, it required four semesters of Greek. And so, my first semester of Greek, the beginning of my junior year of college, I worked harder than I'd ever worked for a class before. But despite my best efforts, I finished that semester with a D. And to continue on to the second semester, I needed at least a C or better. And so a D meant that my whole graduation plan would have been thrown off for a year. And since I was paying for college by myself, it was a huge setback for me. And I began to wonder, maybe I'm not smart enough to be a pastor. Maybe I should change majors and consider doing something else. Maybe God hasn't really spoken to me about pastoring his people. But hope is what led me to try again. And I took a, a, an inner term class of first year Greek, a three week intensive of 15 weeks of Greek in between the end of fall semester and the start of spring semester. I hired a tutor, a tutor, I took vacation time off from work, I worked hard, and not only did I pass at the end of that three weeks, but I ended up with an A in Greek. And it was a huge lesson to me about how hope can lead us to persevere in the midst of adversity, because that's what hope does. Third, hope leads us to respond to injustice. It leads us to respond to injustice. By chapter 5 of Nehemiah, the, the work of rebuilding the walls is going well, but the people of God are struggling. In chapter 5, Nehemiah discovers that because the economy was so bad, the poorer people were borrowing from the more wealthy people just to buy money for food to feed their families. 
And he discovers that the wealthier people were loaning that money to the poor with high rates of interest. It would be like a church setting up a a payday lender or a quickie loan center in their sanctuary for the people in the church who were struggling. This was a, a direct violation of the Old Testament law. For instance, Exodus 22, 25 says, If you lend money to one of my people among you who is poor, do not treat it like a business deal. Charge no interest. And so look at what Nehemiah says when he finds out about this in chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. So I continued, what you are doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in fear of our God and avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? I and my brothers and my men are also lending the people money and grain. But let us stop charging interest. Nehemiah confronts and corrects the injustice because he knows that rebuilding the walls of the city isn't worth it if the people of God aren't going to live as the people of God, if they're going to tolerate and perpetuate injustice among them. Later in the chapter, Nehemiah urges the people to give back what they've taken as interest and to return the farms and the houses that they've repossessed from the poor. Because hope leads us to respond to injustice. I wonder what injustices we will see and need to confront during this time of crisis. We see in many parts of the world that particularly in poorer communities, this virus is spreading faster and has higher death rates. And I don't know the reason for that or why that is. My heart broke when I saw a video that many of you saw of an unarmed African American who was shot and killed while jogging a couple of months ago. And we don't know all the details about what happened and we should let the legal process unfold. And I'm not trying to make a political statement, but I found myself asking myself, why does this keep happening? What injustice is buried inside of me or inside of of our culture that needs to be rooted out and addressed? And I don't have all the answers to that. But I do know that hope will lead us to respond to injustice. Finally and fourth, hope will lead us to worship God together. It will lead us to worship God together. After the people finished rebuilding the walls and and repairing the gates around the city, God's people gathered in in chapter 8 for worship because that's what hope does. It leads us to worship God. Listen to some of the verses from Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 2 and 3. It says, so on the, the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand And Ezra read it aloud from daybreak until noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Then verse 6, Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And then verses 9 and 10. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest, and the teachers of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to to them all, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people have been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some of those who have prepared nothing. This day is holy to the Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The pastor Ezra gets up and preaches a sermon. He leads the people to worship God. All of the leaders call for a feast day, a day to celebrate God because the joy of the Lord is their strength that day. Hope leads us to worship God together. And that's a hard subject for me to talk about today since we're still at our, in our stay-at-home orders and participating in worship remotely. 
We yearn to worship together face to face, to to receive the Lord's Supper, to receive new members, to, to baptize people who are waiting to be baptized, to greet one another, to hear our choir again, to sing, and to just be with each other. I long to see your faces again, to greet you as you come in and as you leave, to hear your stories And I need to tell you that as leaders here at Glenkirk, as much as we yearn for that day to come and what a day, great day of celebration it will be, we are committed to not doing it until we're sure we can do it safely and lawfully by abiding by our county and state orders about worship gatherings. And once those orders are lifted and eased by by abiding by all of the social distancing guidelines that are given... And until that day comes, we yearn for the experience of Nehemiah chapter 8. Because that's what hope does. It leads us to believe that our future can be better than our present. And it will lead us to worship. Living in exile is not the sermon series I expected to preach after Easter Sunday. But I think these five weeks are what we've needed to hear And although there are certainly some important differences between this public health crisis and Israel's exile in the 6th century, the exile provides us with a model, a model about how to live faithfully as the people of God during a time of crisis. Jeremiah's letter urges us to lament our losses, to adjust to our new circumstances, to seek the common good, to discern the truth, and to hope hope in the future. If we do this, we will flourish. But if we resentfully rage against our losses, if we refuse to adjust, if we seek our own good at the expense of the good of those around us, if we fail to discern well, and if we lose hope, we will falter. And here's the secret about the biblical category of the exile. This public health crisis has felt like an exile because of the way that it's turned our lives upside down and disrupted everything about our society. But the truth is that the New Testament presents our entire Christian life on this earth as an exile. You see, our true home is not this world as it exists right now. Our true home is heaven and this world transformed by heaven. Hebrews 13, 14 puts it this way, For here on this earth we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is yet to come. And the book of Revelation pictures that city, that heavenly Jerusalem that will one day come down from heaven and will transform this earth as our one true and eternal home. You see, our routines of life cause us to feel at home here, but that's an illusion, an illusion this public health crisis has exposed Philippians 3.20 reminds us that our citizenship is in heaven, not here. And that we live here as foreigners and aliens, as exiles among the people of God. And so even when this crisis is over, may we continue to lament our losses, bringing them to God in prayer. May we continue to adjust to whatever comes, continue to seek the common good and not just our own good. May we continue to discern what is true and continue to lean into the anchor of hope. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that we can learn from your people's trials and tribulations during the exile. God, this is a time historians will one day write about. And I pray that what they write about your church is about how we were faithful as your people. About how we lived faithfully to your gospel, true to our love for you. That the way that we acted and the way that we lived and the decisions that we made were a witness of our love for our community. God, may we be those kinds of people 
And years from now, may our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren tell stories about how we lived with courage and faithfulness as the people of God during our exile. But we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks again for worshiping with us this morning. Um, I encourage you, if you haven't already, to fill out that connection card. Let us know how we can be praying for you. We want to connect with you. We want to pray with you. If you'd like someone to give you a call and pray with you over the phone, we have people who would love to do that. We want to stay connected with you during this time. I also invite you to join us for the way of Jesus that starts. Now I want to invite you to reach out your hands and to receive this blessing as we close. May the God of hope fill you with that assurance that good days are coming, that his plans for you 
are for your prospering, for your welfare, that they are good plans. May you endure this present time with all of its challenges and uncertainty, with that hope anchoring you to the promises of God and stepping into the hope that He calls you to. Go in peace in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. God bless you.